All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us again for this webinar on coping with stress and anxiety. We have uh, Greg Nichols here today who's going to be presenting this webinar. He is the uh, director of the Counseling Center um, here on campus, um, and he'll be uh, presenting to you on this topic today. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to just write them into the questions box. Um, if it's technical or something like that, I'll handle it. And if there are questions for Greg, he will answer all of those at the end um, when we get to the end of the presentation. Thank you, and uh, welcome, Greg. Thank you, Dan. Happy to do this webinar, probably over your lunch hour. Uh, so we'll go ahead now for the next so, 30 or 40 minutes. And certainly this is a very relevant topic uh, this time of year, uh, especially for students. Um, academic pressure, of course, is mounting. We're very busy here in the Counseling Center. Um, and so the academic pressure only adds to the stress, anxiety, fears, worries that are accompanying us um, from day, just from day-to-day -day living. So it's a stressful time. In this brief webinar, again, I want to provide you with a, I'll give you a couple of practical uh, techniques or strategies that can help buffer the anxiety and stress that we all feel. But I also want to leave you with a general message about how you can better approach dealing with anxiety and stress so that it doesn't get in the way of doing what we really want to do on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the long run so that the worries, anxieties, and fears, so they don't obstruct us from living a life according to our values so that we can lead a more expansive life rather than a constricted one, which worries, anxieties, and fears, of course, um, create because they can tend to shut us down. Um, and, and make us be a long way from being at our best, whether that's inside the classroom or outside the classroom. Doesn't advance. One moment. Okay. Next slide. Just have a, a second there to advance the slide. We're all set. So. Any Anyway, this is interesting. These are factors that's, that can get in the way of doing well academically. This is a question, actually, that appears on a questionnaire that goes out to students across the nation every, well, every year, and for our students every three or four years. So one of the questions asks simply, if you didn't do well on a test, in a course, um, on a paper, what were the reasons why? And students can check off as many reasons as, as they see on the list. Um, and this is only a partial list um, that apply to them. So what I'd like you to do out there is to just look and try to guess. You can either say for yourself what, what reasons you would put down if you didn't fail academically on a particular uh, test or in a particular course. Or you can think about what the most common would, would be, kind of your guess as how, how students would typically respond. What would be the first, what would be the most popular? What item would be checked the most? How about second, third, and fourth? I'll just give you a moment to do that. Okay, let's, let's take a look. So these are the top 10 responses, and they come up pretty consistently, although there have been some changes over the last, oh, 10, 12 years or so. Stress and anxiety. You probably would have thought that, considering what the topic of this webinar is. That's number one. It has been number one every year I've looked at the results for the last um, decade at least. Sleep difficulties actually has gone up the charts, um, so to speak, in the last several years. It wasn't as high as number two um, in previous years. Maybe it's not shocking. You know, we know that um, you know, it's a chronic problem. It probably is getting worse and worse. And, uh, and certainly the two of these go together. Stress and anxiety can certainly cause us problems with our sleep. Colds and flu, work, that might, might be even higher for you know, our adult student population, um, but certainly is, is very relevant as an as a obstacle. This has, not surprisingly, has gone way up the charts in, over the years. Uh, social media, internet use, we're tethered to our phones. Um, I think that creates stress more than anything. Depression, concern for a troubled friend or family member, 
and the rest. But you can see that most of these are, are psychological in nature. With stress and anxiety at the top, several of these are going to correlate with that. So stress and anxiety certainly are an obstacle to learning. Stress, anxiety, and worry directly compete with cognitive function, functioning in the prefrontal cortex. It's very difficult to worry, to feel stress, um, to have all those worries and thoughts, and also to focus on, on an exam. You, we can't do both. So it certainly um, is a factor, especially for those of us who have um, you know, a bit of test anxiety or presentation anxiety. So we live in an age of anxiety. I think more than ever, it's a very stressful world. We have 24-7 breaking news, as we know. Um, our, our incomes you know, have typically shrank um, over the years in relation to the cost of living. Technology probably has helped in so many ways, but I don't think in terms of, of um, decreasing anxiety and, and stress. As I said before, we're tethered to phones. We have tech, texts coming in you know, all day and night. It's no longer something that, our, our, that teenagers are doing or even um, traditional age college students. All of us are affected, I think, by social media, um, by our, our phones. And they create distress because we, we tend to, the, the natural tendency is to personalize text that we get and read into the tone um, that's maybe not intended. And we not only get stressed over some of the texts we receive because they're not quite you know, what we expected, but we, get, we, we feel stress over the ones that we don't get, right? That we think we should be getting. And uh, so when I talk to students, and this applies to myself as well, um, dozens and dozens of texts a day that have maybe just minor shifts in my stress level and my mood, and sometimes more major ones. And I'm sure that's, that's, the, case, that's the case for you. And in our counseling center here, we measure anxiety levels um, with all the students that we see. We have a questionnaire that's shared by counseling centers across the country. So we can compare to our students to those nationally. Now, these are students who are coming in for counseling. But um, they do sh the, the anxiety scores are creeping up over the years. And these are, um, you know, we're asking questions about uh, their tension, whether they have racing thoughts, rapid heartbeat, um, panic. And um, again, uh, and we're not alone. It's not just St. Joe's. But um, it's a more, the point is this is a more and more um, a very stressful world that we're living in. So, um, yeah, so, so social media. Um, and, and you know what's interesting about social media? Now you're talking about Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat. That studies show that if, when we are very passive, about our use of Facebook, Snapchat, and other social media sites, um, our mood tends to lower in general. I think it's because everyone that's on these sites is, is typically putting their best foot forward, presenting their best images and photos, the best side of themselves. And if we're a passive observer, then we can't help but compare. This is true for many of my students, and I guess in general. Um, uh, and, and then we see we come up short. So when they've done studies, they found, you know, in general, moods tend to lower a bit when we're very passive. Now, if we're, if we're posting things on our own, if we're having an active engagement with social media, that's different. Um, then mood is not negatively affected. But this is something to think about um, in terms of our, you know, again, our day-to-day -day life. So we all probably are familiar with the fight and flight, the fight or flight response um, when stress and anxiety rise. We have the same bodily reaction that was useful thousands and thousands of, of years ago when there were obviously many physical, physical threats that humans had to deal with and our body would gear up in the best way to either flee or effectively fight. Um, but in no way is it adaptive to the psychological pressures and psychological stress that we encounter. But it's the same response. And um, that's, this is 
you know, what we have to deal with, and we have to try to um, figure out a better way to, to deal with this natural response that takes over um, that really inhibits our ability to focus and to concentrate and to perform well in, um, in almost all of the tasks that we face. So these are some of the things that happen to us, especially when stress and anxiety is chronic. Then this um, fight or flight response, the physiology involved uh, over time is obviously not good for our, our health. Um, and, and that's a, an issue that you know, so many of us have to, have to deal with and be, and be thoughtful about. Now, I want you to look at this list and maybe to, you know, just think about which ones could apply to you. And as I look at this, I know I've got a couple here that I would check off for myself, even with the work that I do. Because uh, this way of kind of um, coping with anxiety and stress, it's sort of instinctual. It's sort of what we automatically do. Um, and not that they're all negative as well. Sometimes in, in the short term, um, some of them will apply and they're adaptive. Okay, typically avoiding situations that make us feel anxious, trying to push out or eliminate disturbing thoughts and feelings, trying to talk ourselves out of anxiety, fear, panic, and worry, just replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts. How many times have we been told to just think positively? And that's easier said than done, right? Um, distracting ourselves from anxiety, fear, and, worris and worrisome thoughts. This can be adaptive at times. But over the long term, just consistently using distraction really doesn't solve the, you know, the issue at hand. Certainly drinking and drug use is used you know, to reduce anxiety and has to be um, considered as a problem. Um, and even you know, taking anti-anxiety medicine on a frequent basis over the long term is, is, um, you know, is not good for our health. Because these are benzodiazepines, I'm thinking of Xanax and Ativan that we become, you know, we can become addicted to and uh, we develop tolerance for. And they can rob us of any natural ability that we have to relax ourselves, natural ability that's still left over, even if it's, if it's been a problem for us. Um, and uh, so uh, we have a psychiatrist here in the counseling center and she'll, she'll prescribe anti-anxiety meds, but just over the short term to help a student function. Um, for the, maybe the next week or two to help a student really get the sleep, you know, that they need in the short term, the long term. So you can think of um, that the idea that we're we're actually gripped by our worries and fears, and when they take over, you know, those worrisome thoughts that create stress, we we can totally believe what our mind is telling us, right? The anxious part of our mind, you know, it feels like the truth in the moment that we're going to fail, for example, um, whatever that negative thought is. And the Chinese finger trap here, I think, is a really good metaphor because the harder that, you know, the idea is the harder we try to get out of it, the more stuck we get. It's the same thing with our worries our, and our anxious thoughts. The more we try to get rid of them, the more we try not to have them, well, the more we have them. <laughs> so uh, we've got to use a different approach, a different strategy to deal with all the negativity um, that comes our way, especially in terms of what our mind can generate. And I, I'd like you to kind of think about this in, over, overall, too. It, it can be a good sort of adaptive practice to be a bit suspicious of what our mind is telling us, our mind is telling us, especially when we're under stress. Because it's often going to not tell us, give us an accurate picture of, of what is really going on. So why is attempting to get rid of fears the wrong approach? Well, simply, you know, it's very hard to control our thoughts, um, especially when we're when we're feeling very anxious. So you know, the idea here is don't don't think about a pink elephant. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. And if we're told that over and over again, of course, that's all we can think about is a pink elephant. So you kind of get this notion that trying to control the mind and stop anxious thoughts. Um, it's just not a good overall strategy. So we need more than positive self-talk. 
we only we didn't discover this until not too long ago um, that we need more than just positive affirmations. This goes back. To, this probably dates me a bit, but this is our, actually our senator from Minnesota, Al Franken, who was of course a Saturday was on Saturday Night Live and played this character, Stuart Smalley. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Um, well. Again, we often give advice to people to just look at the bright side and, you know, be positive and listen, keep your chin up. But we know when we're told those things, they don't often resonate and they're not persuasive. So, so a different approach, um, yeah, accept the anxiety in a way to lessen its impact. We have to kind of get into a habit and we can develop this over time of not believing everything that we think, that our thoughts are not us. Our thoughts can be like leaves on a stream. They're going to pop up. Our mind, you know, is going to come up with negative thoughts, worrisome thoughts, whether we like it or not, right? Our mind can tend to turn on us, turn on its host, so to speak. But, but realizing that, we can adapt and have a better way to kind of accept, if you will, that, we're, that these worries are going to come up. Um, they're not going to help us in any way. But, but, but recognizing that and saying to ourselves, I'm having the thought that I'm going to fail, as opposed to, I know I'm going to fail, and having it grip us um, and take over, having the thought can separate ourselves from the negativity and have a better chance of sort of passing by, or at least a better chance of loosening up um, and not gripping us and bringing us down. Um, again, this is all easier said than done. And when I work with clients, it's, it's a, you know, it's a longer term process. But I just want to kind of plant the seeds of this approach. And if you're curious and you want to try to train your mind um, to think in, in this way, as opposed to maybe the way that instinctively, you know, you've been trying to cope, then there are great books. Um, you, you know, you can see a counselor. At the end of this, I'm going to leave my phone number, my email. Um, you can ask me questions through email. Um, you can even come, I could even, you know, have you come in for a visit or two. But anyway, you'll see that at, at the end of this presentation. So the, so the idea is to, to kind of step back when you're in the midst of um, feeling very anxious and say something like, there goes my mind again. There goes that train of thought. There goes my anxious mind again. And that, again, sort of separates us from the thought. Now, we don't have to be driven by it. Um, and again, it's just a, it's a habit. The more we practice it, the better we get at it. So, so this is an overall challenge that we have, a balancing act with have play or which maybe is in days, right, in the month of April. Uh, as a college student, and certainly sleep, which for many of us can be a very big challenge. It doesn't come easily, and we know with sleep, the harder we try, the worse it gets, right? So we try to create the conditions for sleep to come over us instead of telling ourselves we have to sleep, we have to sleep, we have to sleep. Um, so that fits into that same kind of area of how we deal with anxiety, too. But certainly all of this is a balancing act, and many times it goes out of balance. Um, and certainly right now, it's probably very tough to have a balance, you know, in our lives this month. Of course, one way of downshifting, now we all need a kind of a way, our own way of downshifting. It doesn't have to be mindfulness or meditation. That's just one way. But I wonder if you have a, a, a good way that you can buffer anxiety and stress. Um, a good way that in essentially uh, you downshift so that you can clear the mind, restore the mind, which helps with memory, for one, and, um, and allows us to have a fresh start in whatever we're going to do next. So mindfulness is, is of course, one way, mindfulness meditation. Um, it's about awareness in the present moment with acceptance and without judgment, because we tend to, our natural mind tends to you know, jump around and compare, and we judge things, and we judge ourselves. So when we're practicing mindfulness, um, 
you know, we, we, we know our mind's going to be doing that, but, but it's, a, it's a kind of like focusing back on our breath, being in the present moment, realizing we're going to get distracted, but keep coming back, beginner's mind, so to speak. And mindfulness is not positive thinking or just another relaxation technique. Um, it's not trying to blank the mind. Foundations of mindfulness. So this is what one would cultivate if they practice mindfulness meditation. These are pretty good qualities to, for us to gain, right? Non-judging, patience, beginner's mind, starting fresh, right? Without judgment, without something kind of left over that's interfering with the rest of our day or days. Trust non-striving, acceptance, and just letting go. Seems like the perfect antidote for our times, right, our stressful times, but it's not for everyone. Um, some people just don't take to it very well, and the discipline of meditating every day um, is, is difficult to acquire. But this might intrigue you. Um, as meditation, they've done some studies in the last oh, 10, 15 years which show that um, meditating, as the slide says here, for only about 30 minutes a day for eight weeks had a measurable change in the gray matter density in parts of the brain associated with memory, sense of smell, empathy, and stress. So there were changes, physical changes in the brain. Um, not, this is not from meditating hours each day, but as it says here, 30 minutes a day for, for eight weeks. That still takes some discipline. Wow, it seems like it might be worth it, though, when, when you see that. So this gets to the idea of neuroplasticity, that our brains um, can still change and grow, you know, even as we get older, into our 20s, 30s, 40s, and beyond. Um, to illustrate this, this, this wonderful study they did with London taxi cab drivers. Um, London streets, if you've ever been to London, they're just a maze, a complicated spaghetti-like maze, nothing like New York City or even Philadelphia. Um, and it takes extraordinary memorization. And, and of course, taxi drivers have to do that in order to navigate the streets and know your way around. But wouldn't you know it, they, they studied the brains of taxi cab drivers, I think, I think through MRIs. I don't think they have to wait for them to die. Um, and, and found that there was a, a significant growth in their hippocampus. And that's the part of the brain associated with memory. So it's like a muscle. The more they worked it out, the larger it got, the more proficient they got with their memory. And it's just another example of how um, we can change our brains. Meditation was one way, and this just this, the task of the London taxi cab drivers illustrates it, illustrates it nicely. Um, of course, um, we want to do everything in moderation. We're not talking about meditating for hours and hours each day. Um, do everything in moderation, right? Um, important to combat the brain's negativity bias. Well, um, this, this I wanted to add to this webinar as well. Uh, because scientists believe we do have a negativity bias in our brain. That means that negative events, painful experiences, have a greater impact and are more memorable than positive ones. There's a greater emotional impact from losing, say, $20 than from finding $20. If we get feedback on a presentation um, we just gave or, um, yeah, well, a presentation we just gave, do we focus more on the, on the nine positive reviews, or do we focus on the one negative one that we got? In good relationships, there's a ratio of positive interactions to negative interactions. And if it's five to one, five to one positive over negative, that's an indication of a positive relationship. Three to one, two to one, positive to negative isn't enough. So you can see where the negative is more powerful. Um, than the positive, and that, that's a good way to illustrate it with, with relation, in terms of relationships. The saying is that you can think of our brains being like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. And there's an evolutionary reason for that, which I won't go into, 
but it's good to know that we're, we're kind of at a bit of a disadvantage to start with when it comes to, um, you know, trying to stay in a good mood. Um, we, have to, we have to kind of work at it uh, a good amount of the time, but it's good to know that in advance. So what can we do? Um, well, it's important so to, to realize there is that negativity bias. And we can tend to, we, we can accentuate the positive in our life. This is very simple. And, and you could start doing this just the rest of the day pretty easily if, if you're mindful about it. So we have to accentuate the positive so that it can resonate with us and sink in more than perhaps the negative automatically does. When you have a good experience, however mild it is, it might be, you know, a good laugh that you have during the day. It might be a compliment that you receive. Maybe your team wins, right? Um, consciously let it sink in, note it, and and recognize or try to savor it just for a, just for a few seconds longer, maybe 10, 15 seconds. Just focus on that good experience. Don't just automatically let it leave you. Um, the longer it's held in awareness, the more brain neurons that wire and fire together, making the memory stronger. Tilt towards the good. Develop the habit of savoring, not just with food, but with any positive experiences that you have. So these are just a couple of photos that I took up in New Hampshire visiting my relatives that I look at from time to time. The blue sky over St. Joe's University last year. And uh, again, you know, I just kind of remember back, remember how I felt, and let, those, let that good feeling sort of resonate. So um, what we're trying to do to combat that, that chronic stress response is to build up the relaxation response. And we really need to practice it because the stress response is automatic and as we've been saying, it comes um, frequently and we feel stuck with it. So we consciously have to work at balancing that out with the relaxation response, which we can practice and promote within ourselves. And you can see the differences here. With the relaxation response, um, it means slowing down our breathing. Of course, blood pressure can lower. Um, Sleep will improve, digestion improves, um, but we have to have a way of doing it. The easiest way, to be conscious of our breathing. I know it sounds so simple, but this is maybe the most important thing I can tell you today, something that you already know, but we know it, but often we don't put it into practice, and we have to have a way of monitoring our breathing several times a day because if we're going through a stressful intense time no doubt it's affecting um, our breathing it becomes more shallow without us knowing it or sometimes we literally hold our breath and that's not good for our health and it's not good for our concentration so so we can get caught up in that pattern and all it takes is to be is to note our breath um, there's different ways we can do that, but when we do notice where our breath is, of course, then we want to make sure that we slow it down. We deepen it a little bit. You have to do that consciously, maybe with a, a count of three as you breathe out, and a pause, and a count of three when you breathe in, and a pause. It might just be a, a breath or two. And, you know, that we see athletes do. We see pitchers on the mound, hitters at the plate, tennis players between points, all automatically taking a deep breath. And you probably do as well. We all do. But we, if we're more conscious of that and we find a way to practice it dozens of times a day, it can really start to, to buffer the anxiety and stress that we feel. So it's so simple. But to actually do it, um, one of the things I do is I, I – I have a, like a sticker. Well, I don't need to do it anymore because I, I, I've done this so frequently, it's embedded in me. But I, I put, would put a sticker on my computer. I'd put a little star sticker in my car, uh, just a visual reminder to, to, to notice where my breath was. Um, and then I would go through slowing down my breathing, maybe just for 30 seconds or a minute, and, um, and try to make sure I was doing that literally a couple of dozen times a day. 
So that's, that wasn't meditating for a half an hour. That was just sprinkling my day with those kind of mindful moments to regulate my breathing and bring down my stress level. Here's one um, way to do it that you can remember. It's called the STOP practice. So that's an acronym, obviously. So here's what it stands for. Literally stop or pause. So there's always that point where we have to, maybe it will be in class, maybe driving in, in your car like I do. Something that you're going to, that's part of the rhythm of your day, that you're going to build in these moments of pausing or stopping. To check, to check in with yourself, to check in on your breathing. And T, literally, take a breath. It doesn't have to be one breath. It could be several breaths. But literally, you're conscious of slowing down your breathing, regulating it. And when we do that, we should notice a drop in our stress and anxiety level. Observe. This goes back to what I said earlier. Observe, observe your mind. Where is your mind right now? Is it? filled with those anxious thoughts. This is where, where you want to literally sort of, or, or figuratively sort of step back and say something like, there goes my mind again. Or I'm having the thought, not I am this way, because the thoughts can make it feel like this is the truth about the moment and about you and defines us. So stepping back and saying, there goes the mind again. Um, and this you can practice, it can get to be a habit. and. Uh, you know, this is a lot of what I do with my student clients, is to help them develop this ability to detach a bit from those negative, stressful, self-critical thoughts. And then to proceed. So these are just short breaks that can be as little as 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or maybe a couple of minutes. So if you see the value of that, you'll develop a way of reminding yourself to do this many, many times a day. I uh, also just want to mention the value, of course, of expressing our thoughts and feelings. Certainly that's what we do in counseling, but it can be, you know, it can be journal writing, it can be just confiding in a friend. Um, but all of us need a way to sort of, you know, get out what's been building out, what's been building up, you know, inside. Um, and I, I sort of an, an interesting way to illustrate this is this spider study, which is a re actually a recent study, only done a, uh, two, three years ago. So they took, in this study, they took people who are afraid of spiders, it's a common fear, and they trained, they had two groups, and they trained them in different ways. And the goal was to have them lessen the, you know, the anxiety that they were feeling, right? And, and they, had a, they actually had a real spider in a, in a, box, a glass box with an open top, 20 feet away from the subjects, and they they would measure the, how they would get over their fear by how close they could get to the spider to the point where they could almost touch it. But anyway, one group was trained in a kind of a traditional way, like with rational self-talk. Um, the spider can't hurt me. I'll be okay. I can deal with this. You can think of that internal pep talk, which we can, you know, which can have some value. Um, and they, you know, that they have a long list of things they could say to themselves to tell them that they shouldn't be afraid of the spider. The other group was trained very differently. They were merely told to express their emotions, to say how they were feeling, to tell it like it is, so to speak. So they would be saying things like, out loud, I'm very scared. I'm feeling very tense. I'm very nervous. That spider is, is big and ugly. So they would be labeling their emotions, it's called effective labeling, but that's merely what they were doing, letting it all out, saying exactly what they were experiencing. And then, of course, they measured who, what, how close they got to the spider, um, and you can guess probably which group did the best, which group had their fear lessened. Well, it was the group, both groups improved a bit, even the ones giving themselves a pep talk. But the other ones who are merely expressing their feelings, labeling their emotions and saying them out loud, they overcame their fear and anxiety the most and got, close, got closest to the spider. You could maybe kind of guess how that could happen that way. When we sort of really sort of acknowledge what we're feeling and we get it out, we express it, 
Yeah, that, that, that kind of relief that you can feel, sort of telling it like it is, literally a relief, a relaxation from just expressing that um, and not being judged for that, um, allowed for the anxiety um, and stress to, to lessen significantly. So I just thought that's just a really neat study that, um, that illustrates that point. And of course, we keeping a journal. I have several clients who keep a journal, and they just write out um, what's you know stressed them out about the week, what's making them anxious. Um, and uh, we did a study here years and years ago where we had freshmen keep journals just just a few days a week for uh, a couple of months their first semester, and then another group of freshmen just sort of said what they did that day. You know, went to went to dinner, or went to Wawa, went to class. Et cetera, just charted their day, and then measured the effects of keeping a journal where you could express what's going on, and keeping a journal just to record the facts of your day. And once you know it, the ones that expressed their feelings went to the health center less, they were in better moods, um, I think there was even a positive effect with their grades. Just another piece of evidence of how we all need a place, a way, to kind of get out what we're experiencing, to vent, if you will. We're almost finished here. So developing self-compassion can be a really, really important uh, lifelong, really, task that we can, that we can take on. Because we can be so self-critical, um, have a self-critical side. And of course, it doesn't help us. We wouldn't dare say to friends what we can end up saying to ourselves. I see a lot of athletes, uh, St. Joe's athletes, and many of them can be very, very tough on themselves. And that, you know, they can be their own worst enemies. And I, I, um, what, one of the things I tell them is to think about, about the best coach that they've ever had. Sometimes it's the St. Joe's coach, but, you know, many times not. And, and those coaches, the best coaches are described as not easy. So self-compassion is not about being easy with ourselves. Right? So, so these coaches, that, these ideal coaches were tough, but what distinguished them from other coaches with the, is that the, the, uh, the athlete felt that the coach had their back. The coach really cared about them, as well as being, you know, holding up a high standard. So the, so the goal is, can we develop an inner self-talk that gets close to resembling that ideal coach, that great coach that we had? Again, easier said than done because there's a lot of resistance to this. Um, again, we wouldn't dare tell our friends what we tell ourselves, that they suck, <laughs> that they're stupid, that they're an idiot, and all the things that can run through our heads at times because we know how much it would hurt them. But if we think about what we would tell a good friend who we really you know, care about, then it really dis distinguishes the difference between what we tell ourselves and, and them. But that's the goal, to sort of bridge the gap. So developing self-compassion is, is a great, great endeavor. There's many books now written out about it, um, and uh, I couldn't, you know, couldn't stress it enough. It's a lifelong task. Here's, here's one <laughs> very fascinating study to illustrate this point. So in this one, there were two groups of psychiatrists, right, um, administering medicine to patients. One group was considered to have poor bedside manner, not very compassionate. Thus, you see the picture there <laughs> on, on the right. Um, and the, the other doctors were considered to be um, you know, quite compassionate, to have a very good bedside manner. Um, and, and so they, to the patients, they administered medication, except in some cases it was a sugar pill, um, you know, a fake pill, if you will. And in other cases, it was the real thing. Well, when they compared the doctors with the poor bedside manner giving the real antidepressant to the, to the doctors with the really good bedside manner who gave out the sugar pills, guess which patients did better? The ones who were seeing the compassionate doctor, even though they were getting an inert substance, the sugar pill. doesn't mean medicine doesn't, isn't helpful because when there's a compassionate doctor, giving the real medicine, then you're really, really getting, um, you know, the best, the best outcome, the best effect. But that's, a fascin I think, a fascinating aspect of that study, showing the value of 
compassion. And if we can develop that towards ourselves, boy, we're, we're really, really making headway. It has a direct impact on the anxiety and stress we, we feel. I'll finish now with, um, of course, the no-brainers to eat right, sleep well, and exercise. Um, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Um, another study they did with fit people versus couch potatoes, and they, they created a stressful situation. That the, they gave them an unsolvable puzzle. They told them it was solvable, but it was actually unsolvable. And their stress levels went up, of course, as they credit about um, completing the supposedly easy puzzle. And both groups, the fit runners and the unfit couch potatoes, both had their stress levels go up. But the difference was is how quickly though the exercisers, the fit subjects, how quickly they went back down to a, um, a relaxed um, baseline. They recovered much more quickly and easily than the couch potatoes. So that was, the, you know, that was the key difference there. I think we all know the value of exercise. It's a matter of, you know, discipline, of, of keeping it up, of feeling like the benefits um, outweigh the negatives as far as, you know, trying to keep at it each day. But uh, more and more research shows that it has, has a great, great impact, not only on anxiety, but in terms of um, lessening depression as well. So anyway, that, that completes um, the webinar. Uh, thank you for listening. I just want to put up on this last slide here how you could reach me either through a phone call and ask for me, or you could you know, come in for a visit. You know, we just got a few weeks left of the semester, but to come in for two, three, or four times, um, uh, I, I certainly have some availability on my schedule. Or you could email me. That would be a way of, of getting into my schedule as well or email me for a question. So um, anyway, that's it for today. I hope some of that was, was helpful for you. And uh, I don't know if there will be any questions right now, but I'll hang on here just for a sec for, um, to see what Dan says. And um, thanks again. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. We do have a little bit of time for questions. And, um, there a few of you have already asked questions. We'll go through these. Um, and if you have any questions that you think of as we're as Greg goes through these, feel free to just write those in the questions box. And if we have time, we'll um, we'll get to your questions as well. Um, many of the questions that we have listed so far here are um, basically looking at if you have any suggestions or thoughts about certain types of scenarios. Um, the first one here is um, how you would suggest, or if you have any thoughts about managing like the stress and anxiety that um, in this situation of having a, a negative um, professor. Yeah, boy, that, I, I have students that have to face this. And of course, um, the natural, again, the natural tendency um, is to avoid. So a professor who's intimidating, I had a student who said, that, you know, she wrote a couple of emails to the professor, he didn't answer back. So on top of him being intimidating, he wasn't responsive. And this was generally just shutting her down. So she was just sort of, um, she was still able to get to the class, but wouldn't approach him, developed a fear towards him. Um, and we, you know, we had to find a way to work with it so that she could function in the class because the fear and anxiety was, had, you know, had taken over. So um, one of the things she did was she did start to study very hard for the next, she had, she had failed the test and that started this whole negative ball rolling. So, so she did have an adaptive response to study very hard um, and, and start to feel confident that she could do better on the next test because she was so afraid of uh, approaching him. Um, but we did, we did work on ways to, for her to gradually feel a little bit more confident in the classroom in terms of where she sat, in terms of um, you know being more responsive to the professor as he was speaking. In other words, everything what we we did was a way of trying to not have her do her of um, give in to her desire to avoid, which would be to to look down, to sit in the back, or to sit to the side. Um, and and of course, that's just, avoidance is a way for the fear and anxiety to grow. But it's a matter of trying to just chip away at the fear and anxiety 
and doing things in a very gradual fashion um, that are going to bring up those levels of anxiety, but then the, but the person can feel like they accomplished it. So that so that my student was able to sit towards the front, was able to look at the professor, um, and then then she would come back to see me again, and we looked at okay, what's the next challenge? Up to the point of you know raising your hand in class, up to the point of um, eventually going to see him during office hours. We're not there yet. But this is something that comes up, and you know, I'd like to work on a one-to-one, -one, on a one-to-one -one basis, because each type of situation, you know, is a little bit different. But but you are not alone. If you have that one, you are not alone. Um, a lot of a lot of students feel that way. Thank you. Uh, this next question here. Uh, excuse me. Um, so uh, the next person asked. Do you have any suggestions for handling stressful times in family and especially young children? Well, without knowing, you know, the specifics there, it's hard to, you know, give give direct advice. But I, you know, I think in general, it's hard to figure these things out on our own. You know, in other words, two heads are better than one. And I, I think I'd like to. That's especially true when. You know, when a student is coming in to see one of us, maybe just for one session, like a coaching session, a consultation session, we can both kind of put our heads together and and um, together try to figure out the best approach, whatever the problem is. It's certainly family conflict on top of academic pressure, on top of all the other strains and stresses we go through, can can really make it difficult difficult to be um, to be anywhere near our best, you know, in what we're trying to do. So I can't answer your question specifically, but I would certainly welcome you to um, invite you to, to come in or you know contact me through email and maybe it'd just be a session or two that we could tackle that successfully. Awesome, thank you. We just have one more question, time for one more question here. Um, the last question um, here, I'll just ask um, if you have any suggestion for what a good way to manage stress when juggling different responsibilities all at once and there's not enough hours left in the day. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, boy, you're certainly not alone, certainly not alone with that one. Um, certainly you'll hear, you know, there's the traditional ways to go about it, and of course you, you already know that, oh, you should prioritize. Um, but, you know, I see a lot of students who, who, when they first come in, they're just overwhelmed. And then they lay out what they have to do, and then I start to get overwhelmed. But then the task becomes um, more simplistic, if you will. The task becomes developing a plan, because what, what creates stress is a lot of just uh, unsettled business, you know, unfinished business. So many things are sort of out there that need to be attended to, and we don't have the time to, and they're just left undone. Boy, that creates stress more than anything. It's often like the little hassles built up. They call it the broken shoelace syndrome. Um, that that you know that create create the great stress in our lives. So when I have a student coming in, and my goal is to have them leave with a plan. It might be a simple plan, and it's usually a short-term plan. Um, and if I can see them in a couple of days rather than a full week, I will, because then we'll set about setting a new plan so that they're taking action steps um, and f at least feel they have a blueprint, if you will, of what, you know, what they're going to do over the next short period of time, 24, 48 hours. Um, so I work closely in that aspect. But certainly right now, a lot of students who are overwhelmed. So um, it's, a po it's a very common concern. Awesome. Well, well, thank you very thank much, you for, uh, uh, Greg, and yeah, I thank, thank, thank you for all of you for joining us and, and uh, uh, joining us for this webinar on uh, stress, stress uh, reduction, uh, daddy reduction, and uh, 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 um, just as a reminder that if you have any uh, questions about other topics, uh, we do have a variety of webinars on our YouTube page and on our website. You can find them at uh, find our website at sju.edu forward slash student life forward slash adult. Um, um, and you can also check out our, our YouTube page. Um, if you have any questions about this or any other webinar, you can send us an email at adultslife at sju.edu. We'd be happy to help you out there. Thank you again for helping us out. Thank you, Greg, again for presenting. And uh, we'll see you next time.